Thank you for that uh, gracious introduction, Jim. It's really a pleasure to be here. Thank you uh, to all of you. Um, I always uh, get a little bit uh, concerned when I'm talking to a group of pastors. How many of you have ever heard a good sermon? Could you just raise your hand? Everyone in the room, how many of you have ever heard a good sermon? I was going to be in trouble if no one raised their hand. Um, I, do you ever wonder how they do it, right? So these are people who basically come up with new material every single Sunday. Um, they have to be funny and witty and theologically sound and deep and inspirational. And if you're in my tradition, um, you have to do that all in about 11.2 minutes, right? Some, some traditions allow for more expansive time. Um, so it was kind of with trepidation um, a couple of years ago that I was on a panel with a bunch of pastors. Occasionally, I am asked to do this kind of thing where there will be pastors talking about on the ground kind of work in their congregations. And then I, as a sociologist, am asked to comment on what a broad group of Christians or a broad group of religious people or scientists might think about these kinds of theological issues. Um, it was a very interesting panel. I was really engaged. Um, the first uh, intellectual, um, wonderful person spoke, a man, and he said, you know, I have three points that I'm going to give you, and he wanted to give three erudite points. Um, the next person spoke, a woman um, who said, you know, I too have three points. There was also, for that particular panel, um, a rabbi on the panel, and he too says, I too have three points. And here I am, like, going through my notes. I've got, like, probably 16 pages of notes that I'm supposed to make. Um, scholars are supposed to be academic. They're supposed to be nuanced. Um, I said, well, you know, what am I going to do here? So I just threw it out there and said, I too have three points, but I have 18 subpoints. <laughs> so hopefully it won't be 18 subpoints, but um, we'll kind of go through um, some different kinds of things today. People often ask me uh, how I came to study faith and science as a sociologist. I've been um, looking both at what people of faith think about science and what scientists think about issues of faith for about the past 10 years. I can remember um, three kinds of snapshots where I had a kind of crystal view that I ought to devote a substantial portion of my career to studying these issues. The first one, I was working on a study in upstate New York, um, near Cornell University, where I did my PhD, um, a study of religion and family in congregations. Met a woman at a Bible study at a church. Um, she asked me what I was doing. And I said, well, I'm here to do some research um, on a particular topic for my advisor. Um, she asked me you know, where I went to school. And I said, well, I'm, I'm a PhD student at Cornell University. And she responded, yuck. <laughs> and I was like, well, I thought Cornell was a pretty good school. And she, and she followed up and she said, well, I don't want my child ever to go to Cornell. And I thought, well, perhaps. You know, there's sort of some kind of university rivalry. Maybe she wants the child to go to Harvard and doesn't think Cornell is good enough or something like that. Um, and she says, well, and I said, well, why? Why don't you want your child to go to Cornell? She says it's because if they go to um, that type of university, they'll meet scientists who will take them away from the faith. And that moment I thought, is that really what scientists do? I wonder if anyone has ever thought, what do scientists really do? think about faith. And so that was one snapshot. The second kind of snapshot is that um, God brought me my very own scientist. So I have been uh, married to my husband Carl now for 15 years. He's a particle physicist. So I've gotten to see science really up close. And I've gotten to experience some of the challenges that scientists face in particular when they try to translate the work, kind of work they do, especially those who do um, basic high-level research that's hard for the average person to understand. I've got to experience that. What's it like to translate that? And then what is it like to live in the church as a scientist? My husband's also a very committed Christian. What is it like to share about one's faith? So first, a little bit about um, the translation piece. Um, when I first met my husband, he um, was working on 
the B meson, which is a particular kind of particle. And you know, I was trying to show him how impressed I was with his work. So I read um, one of his papers, one of his academic papers. And um, the title of the paper, I remember well, because I read it four or five times, was Semileptonic Decay of the B Meson. And I didn't, when we went to gatherings together and people asked me what my husband did, I didn't want to just say he's a scientist. I wanted to tell a little bit about his work. So I actually worked up a little speech about semileptonic decay of the B meson. And I could talk pretty convincingly about that for 30 seconds, so don't ask me any follow-up questions. Um, and about uh, eight years into our marriage, um, now fast forward, we were both professors at the same university. Um, we're at a gathering together. And I, you know, someone asks me, um, it's a sociology gathering, someone asks me, well, what did your husband do for his work? And Carl's um, looking at me and kind of listening in. And I said, well, he studies semileptonic decay of the B meson. And I just start into my little speech and he doesn't say anything. He's, he's not one to ever uh, try to embarrass me in public. And then, uh, you know, we get back in the car, we're riding home, and he says, Elaine, you know, I have something to tell you. He says, for about the past five years, I haven't been studying semi-leptonic <laughs> decay of the B meson. And I'm like, could this not have come up at home earlier? Like, so, so it's, it's hard, right? It's hard to translate um, your work to a broader audience, even when that broader audience is your spouse. And the third um, kind of snapshot, um, I think uh, kind of renewed um, my commitment to the study of this world, of these worlds. I was, um, I'm from Houston now, I'm a professor at Rice University, as Jim said, and I was at my physician yesterday, and I have um, had rheumatoid arthritis since I was 12 years old. And my physician, you know, was looking at my history, a new physician, and he's like, whoa, you have had a lot of orthopedic surgeries. You have got um, some kind of orthopedic surgeon on speed dial here. And he said, um, I'm surprised you can walk. You're just doing phenomenally well. And I remembered in that moment a conversation that um, a physician, when I was diagnosed at age 12, had with my family. And he said, I probably um, you know, wouldn't be able to walk by the time I was in university. I probably, um, my body probably wouldn't be able to sustain a pregnancy um, when I got older. Um, I probably wouldn't be able to have a normal job. So that was age 12, and at age 44, um, you know, I'm walking into a doctor's office walking and I'm standing here before you. There have been amazing discoveries in biomedicine, um, in rheumatological care, um, over the time that I've had this disease. This field has been completely revolutionized um, because um, some scientists thought that um, biochemistry was really super interesting and beautiful, and they wanted to devote their lives to that kind of calling. And so I'm deeply thankful for them, that because of them and their work, I can not only walk, I can do many other things. So I have a kind of thankfulness, a renewed sense of thankfulness for the scientific community. So I'm also thankful to the John Templeton Foundation and the Templeton World Charity Foundation that has supported so generously um, my work over the last number of years. Um, Rice University also has given me several internal grants to support the work. Other work that my research team has done at Rice has been supported by the National Science Foundation and the Russell Sage Foundation, namely that on ethics among scientists and how scientists understand morality. I'm going to walk you through today um, six kind of things. But before we make those six kind of things, which I'm going to call um, six myths, that we're then going to bring research to, to try to dispel those myths. I want to give you some stereotypes and caricatures, which I think um, help us get just a little bit of on the ground sense of why people struggle, why people struggle with the integration of science and faith. Here's some very public voices. We have Sam Harris, who's a best-selling author, neuroscientist, and philosopher. Um, right, you know, along with him, of course, there are others, of course, Richard Dawkins, who says this, the difference between science and religion is the difference between a genuine openness to fruits of human inquiry in the 21st century and a premature closure to such inquiry as a matter of principle. 
The wonderful thing about this gathering is that you will meet lots of smart people, which is really, really fun to meet um, so many smart people in one place. Um, and you're going to meet, along with that, people who are both deeply intellectual but also deeply humble and are using their intellect for the service of God's kingdom, which I think just that experience stands against um, this kind of um, quote from Sam Harris, that experience in and of itself stands against that, but I'll give you some other evidence as well. We also have on the other side of thing, Ken Ham, who says this, believing in a relatively young earth is a consequence of accepting the authority of the word of God is an infallible revelation from our omniscient creator. And so that's another kind of perspective, and I think um, the ministry and work of BioLogos is helping us think outside of that box in very deep and powerful ways as well. These images that we see often in the media um, reinforce the view that religion and science are inherently in conflict. Um, historians, philosophers, theologians will tell us very resoundingly and convincingly that that is not the way it has to be. But people, both um, people of faith on the ground and scientists, experience these two entities as being deeply in conflict. And that's where a sociologist comes in is to understand why this narrative of conflict continues to be so intractable in the public imagination. So our research um, is asking three kinds of things. Um, first, what do scientists really think about people of faith broadly? But for this um, session, I'm thinking particularly about Christian faith. What do Christians really think about science and scientists? And then something that I'm passionate about as a scholar and as a Christian myself who's actively involved in our local church is how we can find common ground. How can we find common ground um, between the science community and the faith community, recognizing that there is overlap between those two communities? What can we do practically to start finding common ground? So pouring into this research, I've engaged in several different studies that have resulted in a couple of books. I spent um, the first five years or so of that 10 years studying what scientists really think about religion, and um, that research in the US resulted in a book called Science Versus Religion, What Scientists Really Think, and now our research team is doing some work internationally looking at scientists in eight different countries and their sense about religion and science. Um, from that, we have gone forward to then look, uh, particularly in the U.S., at people of faith. And so um, our, our book that's coming out later this year um, with Christopher Scheidel, um, who's my co-author on that book, a wonderful man, called Religion Versus Science, What Religious People Really Think. Um, to give you a very brief cliff notes, um, in total, um, we've surveyed across our studies um, about 20,000 scientists and done in-depth face-to-face conversations or Skype conversations with about 1,000 of them. And we have surveyed about 12,000 religious people and done in-depth conversations with about 400 of them across our studies. And feel free to ask me later if you have methodological questions, but um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip over some of that. So here's a myth that I hear from scientists often. They kind of think they don't actually need to think about religion. In particular, they don't need to think about Christianity because it's so intellectual that it will go away. That's one kind of myth. They also think that people of faith in general, but Christians in particular, particularly evangelical Christians, actually aren't very interested in science. So some of the scientists I talk to have the sense of why try? This group is just um, blind to the wonders of science because um, they have their noses in the Bible and this, uh, just sort of why try, what's the point? They also think that there's some hostility in this community, that Christians um, tend to view science um, actually as the enemy of faith, that they're afraid of science. So let's walk through those three kinds of things first. So the idea that Christianity is going away, I think that's um, pretty easy to dispel. Um, so in general, with religion, 84% um, of Americans identify with a religious tradition of some sort. Most of those are Christians, actually. And many use their tradition, we find in our studies, to frame a kind of response to science. So people think that their faith has something to do with science, either the mechanics of science or the moral application of science, usually. 
But what's come to interest um, me lately in particular is that, per, that specific groups of people, namely um, African Americans, Latinos, um, two groups, by the way, that are very underrepresented in university scientific work um, in the professoriate, are also deeply religious. And I think the science community um, has turned a blind eye to how they might productively engage with local congregations to increase interest in youth in scientific work. And I'll come back to that a little bit. But I started sharing some of this work two years at the BioLogos conference. And so um, it's a real joy to kind of come full circle. We've just finished a study on that topic. So 82% of African Americans in the US identify as committed Christians. And these are folks who actually tend to be more committed in terms of more participation in faith communities, um, more religious practice um, than do other groups of Christians. So that's interesting. Um, amongst Latinos, um, uh, Catholics, and there's a growing group of evangelical Latinos, 80% um, identify seriously um, as a Christian across different kinds of measures. So we know that's not the case. Um, if we want to go globally, especially in the global south and in the east, um, Christianity is growing even more rapidly um, than it is in the U.S. for sure. So um, pleasantly, I'm happy to talk about that later if anyone's interested. So even um, if there is a religious presence in the U.S., if there's a Christian presence in the U.S., then scientists still think sometimes um, that Christians actually aren't interested in science. Um, so what we did in our studies is actually compare Christians of different types, um, those who identify as evangelicals, those who identify as part of the historic mainline, Episcopalian, um, is one example of that kind of congregations, Catholics. So how do they compare to other religious groups to those who are non-religious just in their interest in science? So these are people who are very interested, who say that they often read scientific publications, go to science museums, um, try to read popular science magazines, things like that. Um, we see the evangelicals, um, about a fifth of them, a little over a fifth, 22% are very interested in new scientific discoveries. When we get to new medical discoveries, um, the kind of applied work um, that they think is directly related to um, alleviating human suffering in society, we see that that goes up quite a bit. So from 22% to 37%. So there are interests, there, is, there are differences in interest levels for issues that aren't clearly connected to real world applications. And I think that can be a kind of signpost to us of how we keep Christian youth in particular um, interested in science is really showing them convincingly um, the ways in which science does good in the world, particularly good in terms of enduring suffering. And so I think, I think that's very important to keep in mind is that we think forward to convincing outreach activities. Here's a quote from an African-American Christian I, I interviewed a few months ago in a congregation who says this, well, my point of view is this, that science makes you wonder but faith allows for you to focus on your belief, and that is that God created all things. So I don't have any problems with science. I love to watch science programs, history. Um, I have a spelling mistake there. It should be history documentaries. But it doesn't have a bearing whatsoever on my faith and what the Bible teaches us. The third kind of myth is this, is that Christians view science as the enemy of faith. And so hold on a little bit. I'll use one of my 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 very favorite words, nuanced. I, I did media training at Rice University. Um, this is a little aside about how to reach a broad public with social science research. Um, and my, my media trainer said this. He said, Elaine, you've got to stop using that phrase. It's just nuanced. He said, you know, you, people want to hear like three bottom, as again, three points. What is it with this? Want to hear three bottom line points of how it is. They don't want to hear like it's complicated, it's nuanced. He's like, and then I became obsessed with the word and started using it constantly in my teaching. It's like I can't not use it now. So, so be careful when you watch yourself on tape. Just, just don't do it. Um, so... So this huge thing um, about Christians being science, the enemy of faith, I do think this is actually kind of a nuanced thing. So hold on a little bit here, and we'll kind of play this out. Uh, I can't do it. I can't do it. So actually, um, all across all religious groups, religious Americans do not express negative attitudes about science's contributions to society. So in general, they think that science is contributing to society. They value 
the work of science, okay? So here's one of the ways. We have lots of different kinds of questions that we can ask to get at this underlying concept. But we do, we ask them to respond to this statement. Overall, modern science does more harm than good. Um, and we find that evangelical Christians are right up there with other Americans. Um, interestingly, this is a, a small difference in magnitude, but statistically significant. They're actually a little bit more likely um, than those who are religiously unaffiliated um, to think that overall modern science does more harm than good. So they like science. And I think that comes as kind of a surprise to some scientists that there is um, a receptiveness to science. So kind of let that, let that hang with you a little bit. But, and this is the, the nuance part, but 36% of evangelical Christians think that most scientists are hostile to religion. And when we go into congregations, when we interview people, we find that this kind of view is particularly acute amongst evangelical Christians. Um, our results find that evangelical Christians on the whole, as well as mainline Protestants and Catholics, really love science, think science is great, but they almost, um, on the whole, universally, and 36% even say that there's hostility, they think scientists do not like them, right? So they don't have a problem with science, but they have a problem with scientists. And I think that that can begin to inform some of our outreach as well that we can start trying to break down barriers by simply exposing these communities to each other. And that people um, like a Francis Collins, but also like many of your bench scientists or scientists who are working in astronomy and other fields of science who are actually in the pews um, can very powerfully break down this view if their um, faith leaders, if their pastors, given them an open space to talk about their work, scientists in the pews can start to, can start to actually dispel myths, I think, very powerfully. Um, there was a Templeton-funded program, Science and Congregations, that um, was led by Greg Kutsona a few years back that I participated in. And I think things like that can go a long way um, as well as, of course, the extraordinary efforts of BioLogo. So if you're a scientist here and you're involved in a local congregation, start talking about your work in that congregation. I think that goes a long way. Um, here's an evangelical Christian that I guess that scientists do have an agenda of trying to disprove God, and I wonder if certain scientists are against Christians. So in brief, um, and here's the sort of how they view conflict. I want to talk to you just a tad about that in my few minutes remaining. Um, look at this, 48% of evangelical Christians say that science and faith can be used to support each other. So there's actually um, a pretty persuasive, and I didn't have time to put up other data for other religious groups, but this is the highest of any religious group, um, this nearly 50%. Um, there is a kind of uh, receptiveness to the possibility of collaboration. Here are some myths that Christians believe. Um, and I think you can see pretty easily from different kinds of media portrayals and people who write actively um, that why these myths are pretty intractable. First, the idea that atheist scientists are always hostile to religion. Um, people calling themselves the new atheists um, have argued that they are starting a social movement. And um, a social movement implies lots and lots of people. This is not a social movement. This is a collection of people who are writing very actively. It's a small number of people, actually, um, but who have a very large voice, which makes their numerical presence seem louder. And I think we need to work very actively to get other kinds of perspectives translated and transferred out to the media in order to change that kind of perception. I think Christians have a lot of stereotypes about atheists. Um, I, I'm doing some writing about this group right now. Um, there are few scientists, actually, even those who have no religious commitment, who are truly negative about faith. Even atheist scientists, our work shows, are actually seeking the spiritual. 22% um, of scientists who identify as atheists, our broader work shows, um, also consider themselves um, to be spiritual people. So there's a kind of openness there. I'm going to skip over this. Um, the next myth that I'd like to um, use social science to dispel a bit is the idea that science is the major cause of unbelief. And we saw a thread of that in the story I told about the woman who was afraid to send her child to a place like Cornell University. I think believing this has implications, especially 
um, for how we expose our children to science and scientists. So I've just um, last year completed another study of US scientists as a part of this international work. We find that 61% of scientists in the US say that actually um, science and knowledge and training has had no effect on how um, religious they are. And then um, there are people who say that it's made them much less religious, people that say slightly less religious. Um, a small proportion say that it's actually made them more religious. When we put together all of our interview data from these interviews with scientists, we lay out these transcripts, um, we use sophisticated um, analyses um, software in order to analyze them. A narrative that comes up most often amongst the scientists who made a transition from being especially a Christian to being non-religious um, or an atheist is this. They feel that um, faith in particular has really let them down. Um, I remember one woman in particular um, across all these thousand some interviews um, who really sticks out to me who said when I asked her what her faith of origin was that she was raised in a very committed um, evangelical family and that from a very young age, you imagine a person who becomes a professor at a place like Princeton, this person was probably an inquisitive child from a very young age, she was asking hard questions of the faith. And she told me that over and over, she had youth group leaders tell her that she just needed to make a decision to believe that she should not ask hard questions of the faith. And I think that, again, a ministry like BioLogos is going a long way to bring um, intelligent engagement with science into the church. Um, we want our youth groups to be the exact places where our youth ask hard questions of the faith. And I think just even in the short period of time that I've been studying this issue, I think there's been some movement forward in that area, but we can do so much more. Um, she said this to me, when I asked hard questions, I was told just to make a decision to believe. My experiences with faith was that it was a way that judgment was passed on people who are different. And she felt she was different um, because she was asking hard questions. And then this, which I think um, from my broader work and the broader work of our team is pretty easily dispelled, the idea that you can't be a person of faith and be a scientist, um, especially when you get outside of the elite university context, and I'm happy to follow this up in question and answer, um, we see amongst um, scientists who work in research development of corporations, scientists who work at all kinds of universities, um, there, there's a pretty a large minority of them who are persons of faith, even evangelical Protestants. So we see 17% of scientists um, see, see themselves as evangelical Protestants. Um, for Catholics, 19%. For mainline Protestants, 25%. So there are scientists who are um, faith, persons of faith who are sitting in the pews. Um, here's a quote from a biology professor who says this, um, science influences my Christian faith and the appreciation of the whole concept of life itself, of the consistency of the way things operate. It's totally impossible for me to imagine that all of what we have here is come about with any direction or any design or any purpose. Now here's a couple of ways, I wanna leave you with two ways um, that we can move towards common ground. I think that science right now, there's been some exposés in nature um, recently showing that science um, is a place that is um, where there are people from different social classes, women, of course, historically, um, as well as persons who are non-white are very underrepresented. And I think that comes as a cost to the scientific community. People have different kinds of experiences, have life experiences um, that feed into the kind of projects that they choose, not necessarily how they interpret that data, but the kind of things that they're passionate about, um, the way in which they translate, their ability to translate um, their scientific work to particular kind of communities. So the science community is concerned about this lack of diversity. I also think the church should be concerned about this lack of diversity. Um, we should be on the front lines of any kind of social justice issue. And I think we should be deeply concerned about providing equal access to good science education for a variety of different kinds of people groups. Um, there is a massive underrepresentation, especially amongst black Christians and Latinos. Um, and I, I, I wanna give you a quote from a pastor I just interviewed um, about six months ago who said this, I've always thought that scientists are not Christians, did not believe in Christ, 
If some scientist comes in and starts blaspheming God and saying, you know if you're a Christian, you are stupid. I don't know if you could go any further in science. And I'm going to skip over this, this slide. I want to read you another quote from a pastor who says this, science, still for a lot of African Americans, is a no trespassing zone. Um, that was brought home to me in the first study I did of U.S. scientists. I interviewed a man who worked in physics, and um, he wanted to remain anonymous, which um, we always let our respondents do. And he said, I said, well, what's your, what's, your, what's your racial classification? And he said, I'd rather not give that to you. And I said, well, you know, these things are all merged together um, quantitatively. Usually people can't tell identities by um, racial classification. He said, if I tell you my racial classification, that I'm an African-American, you will be able to tell who I am in physics because there are four African-Americans at top research universities in my area of physics in the country. My husband's in that man's area of physics, and I went home and I said, um, Carl, tell me the names of the four African-American physicists in your area in the country, and he named that man second. So you get a sense of the kind of lack of community, um, the sense of um, the kind of representation that's in the scientific community, and I think that's something our churches should start being very concerned about. Um, Here's another quote from an African-American pastor. I think that there's a prevailing notion that chemistry is boring, especially with a lot of young people. It's like, here we go with these stats again. You've got to show them how science is actually helping people on the ground. Um, I think these are people groups, and I, I will put women in there as well, who have experienced um, discrimination and think a lot about justice. Um, and if you um, go into churches, you hear a narrative um, of justice that I think is often lacking in white, um, predominantly white evangelical circles. And so if we can connect science to justice, um, and I think there's a lot of natural linkage there, I think we can go a long way um, to convincing people that science is a possibility um, for a deep sense of calling and that a diversity of people are needed, um, a diversity of faces are needed to represent the full glory um, of science um, in God's kingdom. Another area where I think scientists and the church can join and this is my last point, um, is over the area of beauty in science. Um, I think that um, this is not a, a low notion of beauty, a sort of base notion of beauty. This is a profound notion of beauty. Um, you know, we think about, you know, beauty of the, the person. Um, my, my daughter, I was sort of hit home to me <laughs> the other week, my daughter said to me, uh, you know, my, because I have rheumatoid arthritis, my hands are, look kind of crippled and bent. And she said, oh, mommy, um, your hands look so old. And she said, but, but your face looks so beautiful and so young. And then she touched my face, and I thought, oh, I've done so good. I've, I've raised such a sensitive and lovely child with such a compassionate heart. And she looked me straight in the eye. She said, actually, your face doesn't look that young. <laughs> So I, I did not, in that moment, feel very beautiful. <laughs> but that's not what I mean. Uh, it's not about um, pursuing um, some kind of sought-after um, vision, of societal vision of beauty. Um, I think there's a profound sense of beauty um, that science brings. Um, and the church knows what that beauty is because um, the church has um, seen glimpses of God, right? the book of nature. Um, my, my friend, um, one of my favorite astronomers, Jennifer Weissman, um, came to our church uh, the other year to give a talk. And um, my husband had the privilege of introducing Jennifer. And um, this, is, this is what he said. Um, he, of course, quoted Psalm 19, which has been quoted already in this conference. Um, he said, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work his hands. And when Jennifer looks at the heavens, or when any astronomer looks at the heavens, they see much more than the average person does. And that much more does not lead for the Christian away from God, but only into a deeper and more profound appreciation of him. And so when astronomers who are Christians look at the heavens, they see the beauty, there is a much more of a profound realization of what Psalm 19 really means and they can bring that notion, that profound notion, back to the church so that the church, too, is led only by science into a deeper form of worship. Thank you.